Welcome everyone to the seventh se session of Oxford Answers Leading in Extraordinary Times. I'm Annette Mikes, Associate Professor in Accounting at the Said Business School and the Governing Body Fellow at Hartford College. With me in this virtual environment is Professor Mark Ventriska, Professor of Strate Strategic Management at the Said Business School and the Governing Body Fellow at Wolfson College. Mark is currently in lockdown in Silicon Valley, California, where it's six o'clock in the morning. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Annette. Nice to be here with you. How's life in uh, London and Oxford right now? Yeah, I'm in Oxford at the moment. We are having a sunny day and hopefully a diverse and um, a numerous audience out there. So, Mark, let's set out our agenda, shall we? That would be great. Thank you, uh, Annette. And just to welcome everyone also, Really glad for everyone joining us. I know people are coming in from all over the world in many time zones and in all kinds of challenging situations. So Annette and I have spent some time thinking about our research, realizing and trying to understand some of the issues that might be of interest today. Uh, the, the goal really for this uh, session, this seventh session, is to reflect with you on what does it mean to do the work of leading under conditions of crisis uh, very quickly, we are going to think through how many people traditionally view the work of crisis leadership and crisis management. We're quickly going to raise some puzzles there and really start to integrate a view that Annette and I have built together, really paying attention to her expertise in risk and mine in innovation to argue that uh, crisis leadership actually is a form of, of rapid innovation and really embodies principles and precepts and practices that come out of that work. To motivate that, we'll share some details on two well-known missions. One, the sinking of the submarine, the cursed, uh, and the efforts that uh, surrounded the efforts to rescue the people in the Kursk. Also, we'll work uh, with the Chilean mine incident. And again, the incidents there, the core of our effort here is to really use those cases and their we could have drawn from many cases of leadership in crises, but really to begin to illustrate COVID-19 and some of the work and some of the activities that we're all experiencing today. And so in a sense, we wanna work through those cases, draw out some lessons and begin to reflect with you on these questions. What does it mean to lead under conditions of crisis? We have, we think both a practical and a novel set of insights and we look forward to your questions and comments. Yeah, at times like this, many of us feel the need to turn to works of art and literature. Mark and I have had a discussion about our favorite novelist, Iris Murdoch, who used to be a philosopher here in Oxford and a wonderful novelist. Uh, her words resonated particularly well with us today. Um, at some point, she talked about cri crisis, uh, which she considered to be part of what she called as a philosopher the foul contingency of life. Crisis induce such terrible anxiety. I think we can agree we all feel that today. This is because crisis image the possibility of total and irrevocable failure. And I think not just in, at a personal level, but we feel this stress in our organizations. And if we are policymakers, we feel it in our governments and other, than other institutions. Now, the other question that is raised at this point, how do we operate in environments like this? As put by Murdoch herself, how can one live properly when the beginnings of one's action seem so inevitable and justified, while the ends are so completely unpredictable and unexpected? We are in new territory now. Uh, the world is not predictable, not stable. Standard processes and routines are not working. So management has got new challenges here. We have to break away from our plans and scripts and routines and find our own way through. Another novelist whose words we found particularly resonant is F. Scott Fitzgerald. Some of you might know his test of a first rate intelligence, which in this time becomes the test of leadership as well. The ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. This resonates with us first because we feel the paradoxes of leading through COVID-19 
19 every day. Are we protecting lives or are we protecting livelihoods? These priorities in normal times are not in conflict with each other, but in the COVID-19 world, they have come into tragic conflict. Mark, does management theory help us with this kind of management challenges? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, really interesting. I, I, I'm happy that we start out with a couple of novelists and philosophers. They give us, as often happens in the humanities, kind of core tools to worry about and to act in the face of difficulty. Uh, I think management scholars uh, have actually reflect on these issues as well. Uh, I want to uh, flag for, for colleagues in the audience a couple of ideas. One is the work in strategy that really has been birthed by people like Jim March and others. Uh, this is the well-known idea of exploit and explore. How do organizations at one time both do what they do today, make money today, engage today, use routine practices to optimize outcomes, and at the same time, how do they begin to explore? How do they begin to imagine and prototype and develop? And the challenge of that ratio of exploit to explore is one of these places where you have to hold contradictory ideas, you have to act and engage, in ways that at first seem incommensurable, but over time you resolve that in through timing, through uh, structures, through culture. So that's one uh, important view. Another, I think I'll mention is a longtime Oxford colleague, Steve Rayner, who really uh, built on the work of a number of scholars. He was interested in what he called the presence of contradictory certitudes. That is, we are able and we need to be able to hold intention to positions which are fully contradictory, but both are true. And I think the point you made, uh, uh, Annette, around lives and livelihoods is one of those. Both are true, both are critical. We have to begin to imagine ways to integrate across what seem like orthogonal issues. And that's, I think, the work that many leaders uh, are facing today, beginning to go deeper, to think about timing, to really begin to pull out how do you reconcile what at first blush in the context of existing routines, in the context of how we normally operate, those issues of life and livelihood seem opposed. The task is to begin to find ways to integrate across them. I also think just a third colleague I'll mention, Roger Martin, many of the people, many of the colleagues in the audience know, Roger Martin was the dean at the Rotman School at Toronto and really uh, argued for an idea that I think is powerful today. He argued for the, the importance of integrated thinkers, people who are both, he called them nimble-minded, broad-minded, and hard, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, and uh, tough-minded. And the idea there was nimble is able to hold many kinds of ideas and, and move among different worlds and different insights. Broad-minded, being able to hold those ideas in tension, much as you said, Annette, with F. Scott Fitzgerald, and finally, tough-minded, able to make decisions, but understanding those decisions have to integrate many stakeholders and give us information to proceed in informed ways. Mm -hmm. Let me invite you to come back in, Annette. I know you've got a comment on this. Yeah, we, we've decided to illustrate these points with two high-profile rescue missions. The reason we did this is that these situations bring the dilemma to life. We want to protect lives, but there are other agendas at play as well, which is of course true in the COVID-19 world. We're going to start with the first of the two cases, the cursed submarine rescue mission. This occurred 20 years ago in August 2000 um, in Russia's Barents Sea. The Kursk was Russia's flagship nuclear submarine, which was participating in a large military exercise uh, on that August day. Unfortunately, there occurred a malfunction in the torpedo room, and one of the torpedoes exploded there. Uh, in a few minutes later, all the other torpedoes sympathetically exploded too, destroying the front compartments of the Kursk and taking all lives with, with it at the same time. But this being a nuclear submarine had a nuclear bulkhead which held. So the compartments in the aft of the submarine remained intact. And the sailors who were residing there were very likely were alive at the moment when the Kursk lost communications with the rest of the fleet and 
settled on the bottom of the barren sea. Inside the Kursk, it was becoming dark and cold pretty fast, but the sailors who survived knew what to do. In retrospect, we know there are 23 of, there were 23 of them, but at the time that wasn't possible to know. So these sailors changed into their thermal clothing and started to go on about the routines of preserving oxygen, taking out carbon dioxide, and trying to make sure, or trying to detect any kind of water ingress and deal with that. As it happens, the submarine was in very shallow waters by all standards. If you look at this picture and you imagine a powerful magical lever that would lift the submarine by 90 degrees upwards, a third of the ship would have been out of the water. So the sailors had a dilemma. They could have attempted an ascent and try to essentially escape to the surface of the sea, or they could have stayed inside the submarine and waited for rescue. Given that they knew they would be found very quickly, they quite rationally decided to stay inside and wait. I often think about your sailors waiting in the dark for the experts outside to save them. And this is the first time in my life that I'm thinking of ourselves, all of us in lockdown, waiting for the experts to come up with the vaccines and the technologies that we need and save us. We are going to contrast this case with the predicament of the Chilean miners who, 10 years, who in an event that occurred 10 years later in 2010, also in August, found themselves trapped inside uh, a, a very old mine. Being a very old mine, these people were working at incredible depths. You can see that 2,300 feet down, that's 700 meters down. There was a rockfall of 700,000 um, tons of some of the planet's hardest rocks caving in, which blocked any kind of entrance or exit that they could have had. However, at that depth where they were working, there was a refuge available, a room about the size of the kitchen where I'm standing in now. And in that room, they gathered. Um, 33 miners were missing on the surface after this incident. So we could have assumed that all 33 were gathering there, but we couldn't know because we didn't know how many survived the rock fall. So these people were gathering there. Nobody knows, knew whether they were alive or not. And at the same time, the challenge was given for the rescuers. There was just no technology in existence at the time that could have quickly created a borehole um, wide enough to send down a rescue capsule. Just to give you the perspective on the depths we are talking about, the 700 meters is more like two Eiffel Tower heights deep down in the ground. So if you compare these challenges, at first sight, it seems like that the Kursk survivors had a better chance for a successful rescue. Their location was known. They were quickly, in principle, found, at least their datum was located. They were in shallow water and the rescue technology that was necessary to bring them up was in existence. Unfortunately, the Russian Navy didn't have that technology. It had something close, but not quite adequate. But two other navies, the Norwegian Navy and the Royal Navy offered assistance. And between themselves, these other rescue parties brought all the assets to the, to the a site that was needed for a successful rescue. The problem was that at the time there existed no protocol for how the Russian Navy could work together with NATO typed NATO teams. There was no process. So this became a question of could they innovate a process fast enough to allow these parties, these international parties who were not used to talk, work together to collaborate. In the Chilean case, at the beginning, there was no real 
knowledge of where the survivors could be. They were looking for that refuge, but the technology for finding it didn't exist because we only had at that time 95% drilling accuracy, which was just not adequate for finding this little refuge. The experts at the time compared this task to being aching, finding a needle in a haystack. So the technology for finding these miners and getting them out onto the surface had to be invented from almost from scratch. So Mark, let's step back a little bit from these situations and reflect on the similarities that connect. Good. Yep, good, thank you, Annette. Uh, thank you for leading us through the, the details of both cases. They are both serious issues. Uh, in, in listening to you, I realize the, both the hopefulness and the horror of both situations. Uh, and again, not to overlink to today's situations, but let me let me take a few minutes here to um, to sketch out this idea. Annette has given us a very succinct and cogent view. On one hand, the Kursk is relatively uh, shallow water. The issues are known. The resources are available. Though importantly, she said, and this will figure in the argument we make, they are shared between the Norwegian, the Royal Navy, and the Russian Navy. Uh, on the other hand, the Chilean miners are in a much more untenable position, no communication, no kind of clear routines, and much harder to find and to get there. And as Annette said, the technology to that are really not yet known. They have to be invented. I think Annette and I are both using the word technology in a very broad way. Let me clarify that. We are meaning that not only the physical apparatus and the machinery, but also the social infrastructure that holds that together. And you know that's where one of the issues we wanna develop here uh, in the next little while. Uh, the slide that you can see here really reminds us, when we think about innovation, we often start with uh, issues around technical complexity and resource constraint. Uh, these are magnified in crisis situations. The account Annette has just shared with us underscores that the current technologies and processes don't apply and there's limited time. This is again, let me evoke or let me remind you, this is part of the argument with innovation. When I mentioned the strategic idea of exploit explore, the idea is today's technologies, today's ways of doing things may not be relevant tomorrow under new kinds of conditions. How do we, how does a firm, how does an agency, how does a community of actors begin to invent in real time under conditions of duress? Uh, questions around management, and here we recognize many people, many stakeholders. Uh, Annette talked a little bit about the families as well as the uh, the individuals in the submarine and in the mine. Media, uh, first responders, today the media issues are even more exacerbated. I know in one of the earlier uh, series in this, uh, one of the earlier talks in this series, our colleagues really thought a little bit about social media and the pervasiveness uh, of media in the COVID experience. Uh, emotion and politics, two questions that are always relevant. Uh, uh, there's the anxiety uh, that Annette mentioned, the Iris Murdoch quote, there's the anxiety of a potential for uh, a fear or disaster or survival. That power of emotion is important. The other thing that we're gonna bring out is the power of hope, the way that leaders and others are able to articulate emotions that nourish people and support them and enable us to often accomplish more than we could have imagined. Uh, politics, again, stakeholder politics, the institutional rules. Uh, you know, one of the themes that we're asking to reflect on here today is that in crises, often existing or legacy routines get emphasized. Some theorists call that the threat rigidity hypothesis, that under conditions of threat, many people and many organizations have recourse to rigid forms. They follow the rules. They stay within what's necessary. Again, the tension there is what we know about successful innovation that instead seeks out variation, instead experiments with new ways of doing things. Uh, and then finally, as I mentioned, the media coverage reinforces the urgency, reinforces the anxiety. Uh, we'll speak to this in the context of COVID. I think, Annette, you're gonna talk us through some of the comparisons, both with the cases we've dealt with and also as we look toward uh, the current situation. That's right. Thank you, Mark. I would like to pick out what you said about time. Time is going to be of the es essence here. When crisis management is not just about innovation, but it's about rapid innovation. 
So time is of the essence here. And uh, of course, there is a timeline for every crisis situation. And how that timeline plays out gives it its own character. In the case of the curse situation, everything unfolded in about 10 days. So the time pressure was incessant. But what there is a, a standard sequence of events that every crisis manager is familiar with. Um, after the recognition of the problem, there is a surge, there is a mobilization of teams and routines that have in the past practiced what needs to come next, the recovery mission. However, there are some crises where those routines no longer work and the crisis uh, of the Kursk was such a crisis. It took the Russian Navy about five days to get to the point to realize that they couldn't save their sailors with their own routines and with their own assets. So even though the accident happened on a Saturday, it was only on Wednesday that the Russian government accepted assistance from the NATO teams. After that, the mission switched to a different mode of operation. Nobody was carrying out the Russian routines anymore, but nobody has worked with the Russians either. So um, from then on, the question was, would these international teams be able to work out a mode of operation that would allow them to deploy the assets that they had between themselves for a successful rescue? And unfortunately, that didn't happen. We we're gonna look into the impediments of that innovation process. In the case of the Chilean mine rescue, we see a different story unfolding. It is from day one that they realized, um, the Chilean mining company involved realized that they needed innovation. And from that day one, also the highest levels of Chilean government uh, decided to take responsibility for this mission and ask for help from whenever in, wherever in the world they could get it because it required such a degree of innovation. So the search process was already about abandoning old routines and finding new ways of collecting expertise and information and help. Uh, they, were, they also had a conceptual breakthrough when they realized that at, they only needed to drill a smallish hole at the beginning just to reach the survivors in the refuge so they can keep them alive by sending down supplies, food and water. And if that task is successful, and there are indeed survivors, then they can work on the bigger piece of innovation, which is to drill a large enough hole to get the escape capsule working. As it happens, it took 17 days to find the refuge. But once they solved that problem, that was a huge relief and gave hope for everyone that there is a possibility of a successful rescue in a situation where at the beginning, experts gave it less than a 1% chance of success. And after 52 additional days, these miners, all of them emerged on the surface. Now we think that uh, the COVID crisis also has got its own character based on um, the timelines. So there is a time to the point when different countries, different companies, and even different individuals realize we are not in the routine normal world anymore. We are in a non-routine world and we have to find our own way forward in this. Matt, uh, Mark, I'm giving it back to you to then talk about how to encourage that innovation process. That's super. Thank you, Annette. Yeah, just again, Annette, thank you so much for leading us through both the difficult uh, situations and the detailed situations. Uh, I think what Annette has shared with us really points to three com conversations I'd like to encourage people to reflect on. We'll have a chance for some questions as well. Uh, we still have su some substantial material, but I want to ask you to begin to reflect on this. We've used the Kursk and the Chilean mining incident really to remind us these are life and death situations, these are powerful situations, and they have a sense of inevitability. We also make assessments though about what's possible and what's likely. And part of the claim we wanna register with everyone today is that the work of leaders often isn't solving the issue, it's often convening 
the people who can begin to solve the issue. Second is those solutions are often distributed. No one actor, no one expertise may have the full ability to solve the situation. So here, crisis management shifts from being do the right thing, do it right now, do it without question, to really cultivating the ability to convene, to experiment in small and meaningful ways, to learn from that. As I say that, many of you will be like, well, there's no time to do that. And that's part of the challenge. Annette made a really powerful point. She said, in the two cases we looked at, in one, the curse case, the, 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 the leadership in the community took almost 70% of the time available to even figure out what the issues were and what they needed to do, let alone begin that surge and that work of innovating. And then they were hampered by lack of prior expertise in working with the other parties, kind of some, some overly rigid uh, views. Again, the cursed is emerging as, a, as an apparently easy to solve situation that didn't work out that way beyond the material considerations. The Chilean mine on the other is initially insurmountable, unsolvable, incredible. And yet what Annette helped us realize is the leadership and the community involved began to parse that problem in novel ways, in ways that went against the routines of how they normally would have dealt with a mining incident, of routines that went against the, the typical way the Chilean government worked. So we have this tension. This is a really hard tension. Earlier in the session, uh, Annette uh, invoked uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and I mentioned some of the management theorists who say, holding contradictory certitudes and doing the work to begin to find integrative solutions is actually at the heart of crisis leadership. And we're gonna suggest now that involves a different set of skills, a different sensibility about time, and a different way of engaging. Um, we're arguing then the leadership challenge in a crisis is, as you see on the slide here, to direct action, but not necessarily control it, to begin to shift toward, in that surge period, innovation, experimentation, in small scale ways. That of course requires expertise, it requires trust. So there's a set of kind of factors here that every organization, every leader needs to build in ahead of time. And that's one of the core insights in these conversations around crises. How have you prepared your organization? How have you prepared the set of stakeholders when the time comes to be able to engage in that way? We wanna develop these ideas and we wanna develop these action solutions in the framework of some work that Annette has done with her colleagues a while ago uh, at, at, at Harvard Business School. It's an article that says innovation process, when you begin to think about process, you think about three distinct recognizable moments. The first is envision. Again, when do you begin to, how do you begin to ima imagine? When do you begin to really test the situation, not in ways that are familiar and already known to you that let you use routines, but in ways that bring in new information, that bring in discrepant information, in a sense that challenge what we believe the situation to be, and by extension, what's possible, what's plausible. A second core activity is enrolling, that is beginning to convene stakeholders, beginning to recognize resources that are available. In classic innovation fashion, beginning to reimagine how we use familiar resources in novel ways, right? And again, these are, these are in a sense, routines to be non-routine. And this is a very interesting question. A lot of research colleagues at Oxford, elsewhere in the world have spent a lot of time understanding how you domesticate challenges and begin to find routines to act in novel and innovative ways. The third E here is execute, how you begin to implement and put this into action. And again, those raise questions familiar to everyone on this call, on this broadcast, questions of implementation, questions of politics. What we've done uh, in these first 20 minutes or so of the session is remind you that crisis management too often has recourse to saying, you've got to act, you've got to control, and you've got to do it now because of urgency. We've shared these cases, very emotionally difficult cases, both in their failure and their successes, to open up that space to say leadership is, crisis leadership is actually about rapid innovation. And then it becomes interesting using envision, enroll, and execute how we start to practice that rapid innovation 
as leaders in these crises, both in the, in the immediate sense of a particular organization or situation, but also in this wider pandemic in the world that we live in, where the crisis is multiple and emerging and changing. And again, this is a distinction, and, and Annette will speak more to this, this question of timing, how we understand crises uh, is incredibly important. Another of our colleagues, Eleanor Murray at Oxford, is doing really important work understanding crises as processes and beginning to think about how you unthread what today emerges as a crisis into these longer term distributed routines of activity. Uh, Annette, I think, how about if you come in at this point? Yes, so my current research mobilizes this framework around the process of innovation, envision, enroll and execute to compare different crisis situations and how they have been managed. And it seems to us, to Mark and I, that this framework is a very useful first step in analyzing the work of leadership that is required in the COVID situation and the differences that we see around ourselves. So just to take the first step of this process, we would expect a leader to emerge, to step up and define the story of that rescue mission. In the case of the Kursk, um, I'm not going to go into the context, we don't have time for that, but President Putin was a new president and he was advised strongly to stay away, not to take responsibility for this crisis, which was in any way relevant to what he's been done doing before. And he was anyway on holiday, which gave him an excuse to say he is going to leave it all to the admirals. The problem was that it was the kind of crisis that divided the admirals right down in the middle in terms of what was the key priority. Was it protecting lives or was it protecting military secrets aboard the Kursk? or even protecting reputation of the Russian Navy, which could be tarnished if it's found to be wanting in contrast with the NATO rescue teams. So as a result, there was a lack of direction, a lack of leadership in which way these different agendas should be prioritized. And this is one of the reasons why in retrospect, we can only say there was a sort of half-hearted effort here, not an all out effort of saving these uh, sailors. Uh, on the other hand, what we see in the Chilean mining rescue, the Chilean president was also advised to stay away from this politically very risky project, which only had a 1% or less than 1% uh, chance of success. But President Piñera decided otherwise. He declared unequivocally the primacy, the primacy of saving lives at whatever cost and projected a very strong belief in the possibility of success. A determined effort of rescue followed, uh, which included the acceptance of help from many, many other parties around the globe. So what we would like to highlight here, the leadership lessons for the envision stage are very much around the need for defining priorities. And this is as true in these cases as it is to today. What are our priorities? Are we trying to save lives at all costs? Or are we trying to save livelihoods, our economies? And of course, both of these agendas are out there. Um, again, again, around the lockdown, we have, got uh, we have got conflict. How long can we keep this going? Can we keep it going? going uh, and can we start switching out of it without compromising privacy values, for example? So defining priorities is really important today. The second part of this is how do leaders communicate the crisis situation? Research shows that the most effective communications from leaders is paradoxical. It's paradoxical in the sense that the crisis leader has to be brutally honest about the situation, but at the same time, he or she needs to offer a rational basis for optimism, not baseless optimism, but rational hope. And all this with emotional understanding and empathy for the suffering of people, either because of this illness or because of the loss of livelihood that upended their lives. Mark, do you want to comment on this? Uh, that's great. Yeah. You know, also, uh, Annette, we have a lot of questions coming in. 
would it be would it make sense to for me to speak a little bit about this and we'll we'll walk through all three e's or do we want to take a short break and respond to some of the questions what's the best thing from your perspective i think we could work through the three e's but okay Okay. So just to acknowledge, thank you. You know, many people are sending questions. Thank you for that. We will work to those and speak to them. I'll just summarize really quickly. The questions have to do with when there's no map for the territory, what do you do? Another question is how do leaders begin to learn to collaborate with former competitors? Another is how the complexity of regulation may stymie or shape crisis responses. So again, lots of great questions. Thank you everyone for really uh, sharing with us. And someone also posted, we have uh, participants from over 12 countries. So amazing yeah. and appreciate that richness. Um, Actually, yeah. our next move is going to be answering. Open some that up. Right. But yeah, as we so, are leaving this slide, I would like to leave you with this question. In your own worlds, countries, organizations, you can probably find good examples for this kind of crisis communication and leadership. Now let's yeah. come to the, uh, this is one example yeah. of leadership. Yeah, do you want me to say quickly? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Let's go on. So okay. the second stage of this leadership is around building an organization on the hoof. And this is going to start answering those questions that you were saying, Mark. So I'm not going to go through the cases in more detail. I'm going to highlight the contrast from the perspective of the Chilean case, because that teaches us the lessons that we would like to communicate here. So it's really important. If you don't have a plan, you still have to create an organization. Uh, you still have to have an incident management team that has to be humble enough to say, we actually don't know how this is going to end, but we need to learn about it fast. So we have to create an expert team that is able to advise us. We are trying to learn fast in this environment. We don't have the answers. And one of the big challenges for leaders at this time is to resist the temptation to try to answer questions about when is the lockdown going to end? When are we going to return to normal? Nobody, nobody can know this. But what we can do, we can build processes that allow us to learn fast. So I would like to show that we are back to a world where we, we need to value expertise again. These central teams that have take responsibility for crisis management in different organizations and different countries and institutions need to be able to give direction without, with, with the humility to say, at the moment, we can only reach temporary decisions about which way we are going. We are going that way, but we will have to reassess. So one of the key mantras of crisis management in novel situations is you have to act, you have to act fast, you have to act decisively, but you have to be prepared to be making mistakes. And when you're making mistakes, you have to notice and reassess, reassess, reassess. And it's the reassessing part that's really important, being open to listen to outsiders and insiders in the organizations and, and situations where we are in, to know if what we are doing is still working because we are muddling through. We are not driving through a plan. We don't have a plan. We only have temporary uh, compromises and temporary arrangements. And we have to persist, even persist in failure. And again, it mm -hmm. comes to mind Edison saying about innovation. It's 99% perspiration, in this case, persistence. So I'm sure you can see this um, playing out in the COVID context as well. We are all very aware of the rise and visibility of experts, but as leaders, I think we need to pay a lot of attention to the processes in which these experts and other stakeholders are being consulted. And then the final stage of this innovation process we are bringing to you is focusing on actually managing the innovations that are needed. So in the, as in the case in the Chilean miners, we need new technologies, we need vaccines, we need testing technologies. They needed better drilling technologies that didn't exist at the time. And those don't come just from one, brick, one bright idea. They can come from unexpected corners. So the leadership challenge is to be able to trigger multiple routes of innovation where different groups with good ideas are executing in parallel with each other. Some of them will fail, but that's okay. That's part of the process. The question is not who is right, but what is right. 
and that it's important for leaders to foster that kind of atmosphere. But failing is okay, no blame is attached to those who tried valiantly and fail. And we need to manage the stress involved in this. So this is what it takes, creating a culture of innovation. And I'm going to hand it back to Mark now who can highlight the paradoxical nature of this innovation culture. Thank you, Annette. Uh, thank you. And also what a lovely and, and thoughtful set of issues you've given us to, to worry about. And I'll use that word worry. Uh, what we're arguing here, what we've suggested to you, uh, as you see on the slide here, culture of innovation we know is both chaotic and focused. It's a series of tensions. Again, those contradictory certitudes, playful and disciplined, valuing deep expertise, and also broader thinking, boundary spanning, and finally having high standards and expectations, but tolerating failure. Let me take just two minutes to reflect with you. As you're listening to our conversation, I think many people will be like, well, how do you do that? Isn't that impossible? These are urgent situations. And I want to suggest, and this is something uh, Annette and I both really have reflected on, reflected on in our research and our teaching. Uh, I think words like urgent, when you think in this innovation way, urgent acquires new meanings. It becomes distributed. We realize there are many temporal rhythms in play. We realize there are many time clocks. An old idea for many of us in strategy and organization theory, accounting, and other disciplines is the idea of ambiguity. We've largely stopped talking about ambiguity and instead talk a lot about uncertainty. But going back to ambiguity in its classical form, in its philosophical sense, often reminds us we don't know and can't know. There is no single solution the situation isn't amenable to that. Instead, we have to do exactly what Annette is describing. We have to experiment, we have to explore. That doesn't mean we do callous things in the face of lo people's lives, right? It means we have to begin to think differently as leaders, away from the command and control model to a much more distributed, integrative model where we're constantly asking questions, constantly bringing in new information and discrepant information, and not trying to find out who's right, but trying to reconcile those different views that are richly grounded in different expertise and different ideas and different experiences. So the, the challenge here, I think, of execution and the challenge of uh, Annette's framework uh, in vision, enroll, and execute is in a sense an invitation to reimagine how it is that you lead. Where do you start from? This is not easy work. It's not something you just decide to do today. Uh, Annette put up the photo of uh, Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, who's getting a lot of visibility, along with many other women leaders, who, not because they're women, but because they start from positions of empathy as strength, they start from positions of integrating diverse knowledge, they are getting a lot of positive assessment in this current crisis. Uh, and I think that bears repeating, it's not because they're women, it's because they work and lead from positions that start from complexity, ambiguity, uh, risk. They, they start from positions of empathy and integrating across what seem like irreconcilable issues and situations. And that's a powerful part of the story that we're asking you to consider. Mm -hmm. Annette, back over to you, please. Yes, I would just like to highlight one element of this kind of empathic and crisis-oriented, innovation-oriented leadership. Um, I'm highlighting this because the blame game or, or, uh, around COVID-19 has already started. And everything we know about managing crisis and novel situations is that it's leaders' responsibility to halt the blame game, at least at this stage. It's not time to find out what happened and why it happened and what we're gonna make sure that it's never gonna happen again. That's the next stage of crisis management. We are still in the rescue mode. And in that rescue mode for um, countries to, to be able to collaborate on innovation, for governments to be able to collaborate with each other and with their private sectors for the innovation that we need, we need to limit the blame game. So research talks about psychological safety. So if leaders can ensure psychological safety for their organizations, that's what's needed for people to speak up, for people to bring out ideas from unexpected corners. 
I would like to highlight that in the case of the Chilean mining rescue, it was a 24 year old field engineer. That's right. The idea that ended up the winning idea, despite the odds that it was an untested technology. And it was a Chilean geologist coming out of the left field, as it were, who proposed the innovation that increased the accuracy of the drilling technologies used. So it is because of that psychological safety and no blame type environment that leaders were able to encourage these kind of um, parties to come forward and present ideas. Um, it is still to be seen how it's gonna unfold in the COVID-19 situation. We are in this innovation execution stage. Um, one thing we can do is lean back to the past, turn back to the past, and find some inspirational cases where this unfolded also um, in a way that we would wish. Um, one example that is coming up and it's very relevant today because we are living its 50th anniversary is the Apollo 13 mission. Again, despite the odds, this turned out to be a successful rescue. Now, I think we are going to probably come to a halt very soon, but Mark, if you can see any questions or if you wish to add any comments, this we still sure. have five yeah, we, yeah, we have a great set of questions. Let me, let me just build on a couple. So uh, appreciate, you know, 10, 12, 15 people have actually been sending in questions and Annette, they're very much cued to the work you've been sharing. Uh, I think many of the questions have to do with how do you prepare in this way? How do you do something in advance? I think what Annette and I are, are suggesting is that there are just as many capacity building activities. One of the conversations in the COVID situation is um, how lateral institutions like hospitals and universities are dealing with this crisis. A quick response and a non-trivial response is saying, had we been recognizing the importance of those systems and investing in them over the last 20 years, as opposed to cutting back on them, we would have much more capacity today. We would not be facing these issues. I think the same could be said around work systems. The variance, as you know, by country, in terms of how governments are responding to the looming economic uh, challenges is enormous. In many parts of the world, the government is literally subsidizing salaries for large proportions of the population. In other countries, the government is basically allocating bailout money to a few large corporations. Those have very different implications. Another kind of question is, how do you do this kind of speculative, imaginative work under either regulatory constraint or time urgency? It's a question I'm happy, I think Annette and I were both happy for you to follow up with us. There's not an easy answer to that. Again, I think we'd both say innovation in the long term is a cascade of many small initiatives and small capacity building exercises. We don't believe in the idea of disruptive innovation as if it just comes out of the blue Instead, we see organizations, public sector agencies, firms, civil society agencies, building capacity in an ongoing way to be able to have discretion, to have resources, to begin to practice how to deal with these challenges. Uh, the last uh, set of questions I'll mention are important and go back to an old idea. How do we navigate where we don't know what to do or we don't know what's going on? Hello, colleagues, friends, and everyone. That is the reality of life in the early 21st century. It is the core lesson we will take from COVID. In addition to the difficulty and the sadness and the tragedy, it's the recurring reminders of human ingenuity, hope, and initiative where actions by some start to redescribe the landscape and make more things possible or things we thought unimaginable a week or a month ago becoming more imaginable. That is one of the core insights that the work Annette does in uh, accounting and risk management and cultures of risk and that I do in innovation come together. They find that common place by saying, we believe people take actions and do things. They're not always successful in the near term, but there is shared cumulative opening up of more possibility. And it's that notion that innovation is a cascade of experiments, a cascade of small practices that lets us navigate these very complicated and often very, very uh, troubling and tragic situations. 
Annette, let me hand back. Maybe you would want to say a couple yeah. of comments. No, I think you said it really very nicely. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the antecedents of this kind of crisis management that we have described, there is actually a lot of research going on in that area. I myself am very, I'm working on that question with co-authors at Harvard Business School. And it's, it's an area for how to prepare for novel risks. And we argue that there are processes there are tools that managers, organizations can put in place to be able to switch from the normal world where routines work to the non-normal world where routines no longer work and they have to innovate fast. But once they are in that non-normal world, it becomes the question of rapid innovation. And then these leadership lessons that we have communicated to you become relevant again. We will, after this phase of rescue, will enter a new phase of cultural adjustment, as the soci sociologists call it. We will be doing a lot of research on the diverse ways in which organizations and countries respond to this situation. And we will learn from this. And in light of that learning, we can prepare hopefully better for what comes next. But we still have to stay in this mindset that no matter what we do, we cannot prepare for all the crises that the world can throw at us in advance. However, we can be better at sensing that the world is changing and hopefully gain some time by switching faster. And hopefully having some um, ex-ante discussions about protocols and processes that would allow countries, governments, organizations to work better together will also bear some fruit next time around. Now, we are slowly out of time. So I'm going to use the last minute to flag the next event of the Leading in Extraordinary, Extraordinary Time series, which is going to pick up these issues and focus on leading and organizing for impact in times of crisis. That session will occur next Tuesday, 28th of April at 2 p.m. UK time. It will be hosted by Tim Morris, Professor of Management Studies at the Said Business School. He will be in conversation with Maria Becherel and Eero Vara, both professors of organization and impact at the Said Business School. So on that note, I would like to say thank you very much to Mark, for co-hosting and, and delivering this in presentation. And we are also saying thank you to all the people in the background whom you cannot see and hear who facilitated this discussion. Thank you, be well, stay safe.